Hey, it's Tuesday at six o'clock, Total Schmidt Show. Let's do this. Hey, tune in every week as I travel the world and I talk to entertainers from all over the world. A lot of writers, a lot of comics, a lot of dancers, a lot of singers, a lot of comics, a lot of producers, a lot of tech people, a lot of comics, a lot of penises, 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 piano, piano player type people. You know what I'm talking about. Musicians and lots of comics. Every once in a while, we'll throw in a comedy sketch, something like that, some music, some travel stuff. We'll even do a live remote from one or two of the ports they happen to be hanging out at. That's it. That's the whole show. And I'm going to record it all and put it on the intro web. Sometimes. Usually late. Always late. Maybe. I don't know. And weekly? Nah, 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 maybe. Sort of. Either way, sit back, grab a beer, light a joint, and enjoy this week's episode of... Hey, I'm doing this intro live from my house. Uh, If you're watching, it's Tuesday at 6. I wanted to get this up now. Let's get right to the point. Paige Thompson is a magician I worked with years uh, years ago, weeks ago, on the Norwegian Prima, one of their newer ships. And she's from uh, Chicago. Ironically, right near uh, where I used to live. But uh, we got talking, and then I had her on the show, and then I had a problem with the recording, and then we had to do it again, and we did it. And the reason this is going up today is that she's in L.A. this week at the Magic Castle starting tonight. That's Tuesday, the 24th, 28th. Man, am I way off. Uh, All the way through Sunday. I'm not even going to guess at that date. Um, So she's there Tuesday through Sunday this week. Come on, sit back, watch my conversation with uh, Paige Thompson, uh, and then you can follow us. Just look for the tickers. All the information is there. Enjoy the show. Castle, are you excited about coming to the Magic Castle next week? I am so excited to go to the castle. It is one of my most favorite places to perform because it's really like the mecca for magic. Um, I'm very lucky because where I live here in Chicago, we now have the Chicago Magic Lounge, right. which is almost like the second mecca of magic (laughs) so there's the magic castle and then the chicago magic lounge and they're both just some of the coolest places to perform magic because people are there just for magic so it's really cool how excited the audiences are they're like ready for magic right away which is kind of amazing yeah, it's cool because like it's cool to be able to perform in a place where um, uh, that's uh, people uh, people are there to see the magic. You know what I mean? It's just it's you're not just a magician doing a com- working at a comedy club. You've got your own right. vibe. And the Magic Castle is like one of the cool. It's the coolest place. I can't wait to take. I'm bringing my daughter and her boyfriend. I can't wait for them to go and check it out. It's just got such a cool vibe to it. Uh, it's very classy Hollywood, and it's a great place for magic to be uh, to be performed. So you'll be there seven days, right? Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna be there. Um, starting, well, the day after Memorial Day, that's going to be closed on Memorial Day, but then that Tuesday through Sunday. So I'll be there six nights right. and do three shows a night, seven, eight, and nine. And then what's so fun for me is I have like the early slot. So then I get to explore the castle when I'm done and go watch the other shows. And oh, I have cool. some amazing friends that are going to be performing there as well. Ben and Cassandra Nimser, they're really, really good. So you'll get to see their shows. And then my super good friend who's coming from New York, Mark Clearview, he's going to be in the parlor right after me. So there's some great magic that's going to be there. Oh, that's cool. Good. Yeah, I'm excited for the, to go check it out. Um, I haven't been to the castle in a long time. And I love that old school Hollywood vibe, man. That's going to be really uh Cool. Plus, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look pretty cool actually. I bring in my daughter and her boyfriend to see a celebrity, so I get to go into a fancy place and go. Look, this is my friend. They go at first. They oh, go, yes. are, you gonna, are you gonna perform? I go, no, I'm not performing nothing. I'm just a I'm just a a regular folk Tuesday night. Wait, you haven't worked on your comedy magic set? Come on, honey. <laughs> no, sorry. No, I'm a little off. Uh, I'm a little off on my comedy magic set. Thank you very much. I was in Vegas all week last week, though. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, How was yes. that? It was great. It was a really good week. We had a good time. I worked at Brad Garrett's place. We did seven nights. Uh, it was a lot of fun. The shows were great. Um, I worked with the guy, Francisco Ramos. Actually, he was. I recorded him for a show. He'll be on one coming up. Uh, and I love Brad's place. That's another place that's a classy. It's got a cool vibe. You were like, have you ever been to Brad uh, Garrett's Comedy Club over there at the MGM? Oh, I loved it. That was so cool. I, I lived there like, uh, I, it's been a while now, but. 
I lived in Vegas for like seven, eight years, and oh, I remember right. when that place opened. It was great. Yeah, right on. And now how long have you been in Chicago? Uh, I've now been in Chicago seven years. I just was seven years this past month. So Okay. Yeah. How are you doing with the winners there? How's that going? Eh, that's <laughs> that is not not my favorite because I grew up in California and I don't think right. my body will ever get used to this. But that's yeah. why I thought cruise ships. This will be great. I yeah. will leave when it is cold here and hop and go to the Caribbean. Sounds perfect. That's a smart move. I know a lot of people that do the opposite. I know people that live in Vegas and they take off during the summer, so they just avoid the heat. You right. know what I mean? So it's the same. Same scenario. You just so we find out when the weather's bad. When's the weather bad? Okay, that's when I'll go do the work. I'll work the cruise ships. And you just book the cruise right. ship. Right. When do you go back out on a ship again? Uh, my next contract is in September, and it's going to be for three weeks with Norwegian for um, Hawaii. So. Oh, good for you, man. Oh, that's such a great gig. That's a really great gig. I love I'm excited. That. Yeah, it'll be cool, man. And have you been to Hawaii before? Oh yeah, I love love love. I don't know. I don't think there's anybody in this world who does not love Hawaii. So. No, Hawaii is one of those places like you have high expectations for it, and then you get there and it nails it. You're like, oh my god, it's perfect. Right. Like it's really, yeah, really it's dead on. It's seriously one of the most amazing places, and just the beauty of it. Just when you get off the airplane, just the smell. It's like this freshness. I'm just like, oh yeah, yeah. heaven. It's like a whole different world. Well, we talked about, well, you know, Kozak. We mentioned Kozak before. Paul Kozak, who's got yep. there. That's cool. Um, yeah, he's yeah. got a residency. Man, good, what a great life that is to have a residency just working on the islands all the time, you know? And it's his show. It's his setup. He does it when he wants to do it. It's own space. It's it's really, really cool. I visited him last September, and it's a beautiful space for him. And I love what he gets to do, you know, his own show whenever he wants. And yeah. <laughs> it's pretty epic. That's pretty cool. Have you thought about doing a residency type thing like that somewhere? Although you kind of do that at the place in Chicago, because you right? Right. So that's why I honestly do feel like one of the luckiest performers, for sure magicians in the world, because I have a guaranteed space to do magic seven nights a week. When I'm in Chicago, I am performing at this space six nights a week. So I usually have one night off, and then the other nights I am there doing magic as much as I want, which is unheard of. Nobody in this business has a residency like that. So for me, it's an ideal situation. And then when I want to go explore the world, I leave and do magic on cruise ships or wherever. And then I come right back and have my own spot for magic right here. Hope. Yeah. You're, that's pretty lucky. Cause a lot of like magic is one of those things. It's hard to find a, market for now you know what you mean there's a lot of comedy clubs and there's a lot of different things but uh also you got to be really good i mean like i think there's a lot of bad comics out there there's not a lot of bad working magicians i don't think <laughs> maybe i'm wrong but like i never see really bad magicians i'm always like oh that's really that's impressive or that's good i mean you got to be good i don't know how you do it you got to be good at a lot of different things and you got to be aware of a lot of stuff like i can screw up and just cover it with a joke but you got to know what's right. going on with all your stuff at all times and to do something new is the hardest thing in the world. I, I, was, I just talked to somebody about this a couple weeks ago. Like, if I do something new, it's just one joke, maybe a bit. Right. But you have, it's so rehearsed. You have to rehearse it and work on it so many times before you do it. Like, we were talking, when we were sitting around on the ship, you're always, you're always messing around with your fingers. You're always doing something. You're always keeping it limber. <laughs> yeah. I mean, last night I went to the Cubs game and I had my deck of cards and I'm practicing one-handed shuffles. And the guy next to me was like, what's with the cards? I'm like, oh, I'm just practicing. And he's like, okay. <laughs> he was so confused. Plus, I was there by myself like a weirdo. But I, yeah. <laughs> you went to a Cubs game by yourself? Good for you. All the time. I, I do that all the I time. I literally live a, I live a block away. So I went on yeah. StubHub, found a $13 ticket walked over perfect good for you i forgot about how much of a big sports fan you were i'm going to the dodger game tonight actually a buddy might call me last night with tickets so oh, fun. heading out here at five yeah i can't hey, wait yeah. it's the first game i've seen all year i haven't seen the game all year yet but yeah but i don't mean i don't meet oh, many good. women that are such big as a big a sports fan as you are and you're like you're not just a little sports fan you're you have sports on your phone constantly while you're walking around watching shit 
That's impressive. Yes, yes I do. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. And you'll see, because you didn't get to see my little show on the ship, but no. um, at the castle, the first routine I do is baseball themed. So, Oh, cool. Yeah, I... Yeah, I talk about my love of sports in all of my shows. So that's good. You got to yeah. bring yourself into the show, though. That's what makes it your own. You know what I mean? That's very cool. And that's something though that was weird for me. It took me till I was like thirty one, thirty two to realize. You know, if I'm myself, this magic thing is a lot better because people can relate to you a lot easier instead of pretending like I tried to be so serious and mysterious. And that's just not me. That, but that's what I thought magic was. You had to be this super serious. Right. And then I'm like, no, I'll just, I'll be myself and bring my past and different experiences. In. Yeah. See, that's smart. Yeah. But that's good with any live performer. That's a smart move that you made that. I could see that you would think it's always like, it's always like a mysterious thing. How long now? We talked about this a little bit too. You have how long you you've been doing magic since you were little, right? Obviously, every magician I meet is like that. But you were like that. You started really young, where you living at home with your mom and your sister, right? Yeah, uh, six years old. Six Jeez. six years old. Cool. I a little earlier, earlier, earlier yeah. than I thought. <laughs> My uh, grandma, she got me a magic kit for my birthday and because I'd never seen a magician. I knew nothing about magic. And when I got that little magic kit, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. It had 72 magic tricks and I just became obsessed and I just started learning. And luckily my sister, <laughs> she got to be my my captive audience. No oh, matter right what, on. I'd be like, hey, you're going to watch a new trick today. And... She really didn't have a choice, but um, she's still one of my best like critics with magic because she now she doesn't necessarily know how everything's done, but she has a pretty general idea. So she's very honest and like, Paige, don't do that, or mm, maybe not the greatest. So <laughs> that's good that she yeah. could, that's very constructive. My brother's a comic, so we uh, his his advice always comes in. Like we know each other really well too. We can go. Uh, we, uh, that's not your joke <laughs> or even better. We'll write a joke and we'll go, this is really better for you than it is for me. You know, you just get a better, everybody has a different voice. And once you understand it and they can criticize you, right. that's awesome that she helped you. She helps you build your act. That's very cool. Right. No, she's super. I need that. Cause like you can have this idea and it's in your head. It's this great thing. And then when you put it out into a routine, sometimes it doesn't make sense. And you need somebody to tell you what was that? So, yeah, it's <laughs> you need people who can be honest with you. Yeah, right. And then plus you need to be open to the criticism, though, to help or to help yes. build the act. You know, too many people do something and they go, you know, what you're talking about. I'm going to do it my way. And you're like, All right, um, OK, fine. But if you're performing for people, maybe you should get the advice of people. It helps sometimes. Yes. I really, I, it's so sad, like the egos that you find in performance art of oh. all kinds. And it's like, you don't, I mean, I understand having an ego, but sometimes the ego doesn't let you listen to some great ideas. Um, and that's, that's a big downfall. Yeah. Especially because people approach sometimes live performance very competitively. You know, it's always uh, and whether you're, you're a comic or a magician or a singer or whatever, I notice it with a lot of uh, I, I think it happens with I don't know. I, I want to say it happens with lesser or maybe newer performers, maybe. But I could be I right. could be wrong because I mean, there's some that around a while that still have that old school ego. But for the most part, everybody gets everybody knows everybody has a different taste and a different thing. Some people will go see magic. Some will go watch comedy. Some will go watch singing. But it's not there's not a competition with the other entertainers. In fact, you're all kind of in the same boat one cruise is like one big group of us like that cruise we were on was great that was a lot of fun it was me you quincy right yeah and the, what was jazz right it was the juggler that guy was insane yes. the guy. yeah but uh it, it was so many different angles of comp of entertainment uh the, they got to see all kinds of stuff and that doesn't even include the main stage stuff the singers and the dancers and stuff oh my god yeah it's it yeah that had so much entertainment happening in a 12 day cruise and they, they didn't even need my second show. So I, I, know, was, that's, I was so was... bummed about that. I forgot. Yeah. I can't wait to see you. Cause I didn't see any, any of you, any of it. Um, so, uh, so let me listen. You've been doing magic since you were six. How do you like working the cruise ship thing? How do you, how have you adapted to that? Cause I know you're relatively new to the cruise ship thing. 
Yeah, I'm still a newbie, but I really, I, I really like it. I've loved like figuring it out. It was very intimidating at first. Just kind of, I think it's mainly because of the unknown. Anytime you do something, the unknown of it is hard, but it's such a cool environment. Like, like the people are so happy. Uh, the audience is, they're on vacation. So they're happy people and they're excited yeah. and they're going to this free entertainment. So I, it's a pretty ideal situation. And the fact that you're exploring these gorgeous places and, you know, two nights of shows and a 12 day contract, that's, crazy yeah, it right. feels like i'm being spoiled <laughs> yeah it does right don't say that too loud though i don't want them to hear <laughs> they were like wait a minute we're what yeah because we went out to dinner all week well we have dinner five six times that the on that cruise right or something? it was yeah. great oh my god it was great and the day we spent in st thomas was a blast we went uh oh my god yes oh it my was... god, we got really drunk we got drunk <laughs> that day that was a great day that it was brewery, very entertaining. Yeah, it was. I bet it was at the end of the at the end of it. We were pretty. I I taped a lot of that on the video, and I was watching it afterwards, going, "Oh my god, we were drunk! I can't believe you put up with us." <laughs> walking around acting like a bunch of idiots. The later it got, the drunker we got. It was. It was very fun. It was. <laughs> Yeah, but that's one of the payoffs. That's one of the coolest things about the ships things, though, is you get to meet different entertainers from all over the world, spend the day with them. I mean, we just met. We spent a whole day in St. Thomas. We had a blast. You know, you kind right. of and, Well, I mean, you guys were just, it was easy to hang out with all of you. I'm sure that is also like not going to happen every contract I get where everybody is fun, but I hope it does. Yeah, there's a few that, yeah, there's a few you show up and you're like, oh, hey, <laughs> it's you again. Oh, okay. I'll, <laughs> I'm busy for dinner. I can't make it. But usually, although like I can get along with anybody, like I'm really pretty laid back, so I can get along with anybody. So usually if I don't get along with someone, it's usually because they're a jerk. It's not my problem. It's not my fault. It's not me. It's always on right. them. I go, I just can't hang out with a jerk. I'd rather sit in my cabin and watch uh, watch a movie or watch TV or jump on the la laptop or something. You know what I mean? Right. There's Yeah, there's other options, but it's pretty ideal when it's people that are cool. Yeah, no, when it's, for the most part, it always is people are cool. And there's something about hanging with entertainers that I really dig. I don't care if you're a comic or a magician I mean, we hung out a lot and talked about you. Just something about entertaining. We're I think we're all messed up in a little a little bit. You know what I mean? We're all a little messed up because we are we are looking for we're looking for affirmation from strangers on a nightly basis constantly. You know that's our job this is, true. is to be on stage in front of people and go, "This is what I do. Do you like it? Yes, good. What about this? Yes, good. Yes, and this. Yes, good. You know. So I mean, but that's what you do for a living now. You can't just sit quietly and not have no one paying attention to you you know you know what i mean you're on you're the center of attention so i think you gotta right. be a little you're a little warped in the head to do that on a regular basis or <laughs> we've become warped in the head from doing it from so many years i'm not really sure which one it is but uh, yeah no i i think i think you're pretty right um pretty that's what was so weird with for me during the pandemic i had to do these zoom shows and all the sound was off, so I'm not hearing a reaction. I'm in my room, in my living room, just talking at a screen, and I'm doing magic, but I have no idea if anybody likes it, if it's entertaining, if I'm yeah. cool. I have no clue. So that was real weird. Um, it did, though, like help my confidence in a way, I think, because I had to pretend like I was really good. So <laughs> that's like, I'm doing well in my head. In my head, I'm killing yeah. right now. Yeah, I'm totally crushing I'm so good. I'm so good. Look Do how they great. like it? Everyone's just staring at me. This is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't imagine you doing that with comedy, not hearing any response. Like, it is, for magic, I feel like we have it a little easier because if they think I'm boring or they don't, find me interesting at least there's something happening that's gonna have a crazy outcome with right. comedy like if you're not funny that's all you got like that's you it. don't have anything to fall got. back on yeah i don't have no all you guys my that's it all you guys my dick jokes that's all i got just tell those <laughs> and hopefully they work out and the, the zoom thing was difficult for every performer but for comedy was tough because the laugh or the response was delayed always by at least a right. second or half a second so it threw off your timing. So you would tell a joke and then have to wait two beats and then hear, ah, ah. <laughs> you know, and it would be like a weird <laughs> laugh from one person or not, you know, and then, uh, 
And then you can watch other families like having dinners and doing like, you know, like whole families just having out. And I did a Zoom bingo thing with a bunch of families and they were fun, but they were just they were weird because some people were doing their own thing at home yeah. and there were kids running around. And it was. Yeah, I never want to go back to that. I don't want to go through that. They just had a second bird flu happen. I hope there's not a bird flu pandemic coming because that's what I'm worried. about. No, no, don't don't no, Don't none of that. Don't start anything. That. That's all I need. Right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, no. All right. Um, so you, you said you grew up in California, uh, where you're in Northern California, right? Sacramento area yes, or up that actually, way? farther North. It was the, they call it the Bay area, but, uh, for me, my area was like, nobody's heard of it. It's called Byron, California. Mm, okay. No close to, it's like probably an hour outside of San Francisco, maybe a little bit more. Okay. Um, but it literally was the country, nothing there. I went to a two-room schoolhouse from kindergarten to eighth grade. There was only 40 <laughs> kids in the whole school. Oh, my God. Um, my eighth grade class had six of us. So, yeah. No um, way. We lived. What? I said no way. That's a pretty small yeah. town in Northern California. <laughs> yeah. We lived in the middle of nowhere. So, there was, we had like five acres of land with a bunch of cats. We didn't have like any horses or anything cool we had cows sometimes um nothing very the cats, the cats were your livestock oh yeah the cats the, i was crazy. and i i was obsessed i would run around try to catch little cats yeah we had this one cat that had like six litters of kittens it was insane oh no way and they have a lot of yeah. when they have a litter how do they have they have like eight or nine cats right yeah it's a lot of cats it's gotta be exhausting a lot of cats cat. Yeah, that's a lot of cats. That means one cat's producing uh, 30-something kittens, right? <laughs> and then one of my first magic tricks, I remember making this little box, just like a cardboard box. I'd show the cardboard box empty, and then I'd make a cat appear. That was the idea of it. But the way I had the cat hiding, the cat was meowing. So you knew there was a cat there. <laughs> you couldn't see it. But oh, you could definitely best. hear it. <laughs> yeah. Like, shh. Were you meowing on the side to try and throw them off? You're, you're making a noise? <laughs> Meow. That's just me. <laughs> oh, little gasp. Meow. <laughs> I kept, like, putting, tur I took, like, deli meat out of the fridge, and I was, right. like, trying to like, keep the cat busy in the hiding place to, like, right. have it eat the food, but it didn't work. Well, now so. you started. Now you started a chain reaction, though, because once you start giving him food, if he's not doesn't have food, he's going to meow for more feud, more feud, more feud. Exactly. Yeah. So now you got to constantly keep throwing more feud into the box. <laughs> These are problems comedians well, don't have. And Only feed. magicians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. So I thought I thought animals would be a great part of my act, but. Did not happen. No, it's um, gotta be. That's gotta be difficult. It's easier to carry cards. Yes. Animals. Yeah. Right. Much. Right on. Um, now, how many nights is the Magic Place open in Chicago? It it's seven seven, like seven nights a week. That's really yeah. Cool. So that's great. It's amazing. Yeah. We have different types of pro, like the the signature shows. We call them our Thursday to Sunday, where. There's an opening act, there's a closing act, there's a bonus close-up show, there's a host, there's strolling magic before the show. It's like a three-hour event, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And then the other nights, we have different shows. Um, we have a music and magic night on Mondays with a jazz band and magic. And then we have an artist in residence series that happens on Wednesdays. Right now, we have a guy from the Czech Republic who's so so good so it's it's such a cool place and plus i'm i've been able to learn so much because we have magicians travel and come in here from all over the world so i'm seeing all types of magic and meeting so many amazing magicians it's impossible for me not to grow and become better right now with that in mind how many how often are you changing your act and how many acts are you running right now like you're doing you have one 45 minute show act that you do for the ship or do you rotate uh, tricks in and out? Like, how does that, you know what I mean? Like, how often do you turn over tricks and stuff? Is so, right word, tricks? When... I'm not offending you as a magician, <laughs> am I, by saying trick? It it's not no. trick, asshole. They're it's... tricks. They're magic oh, tricks, okay. I promise. Thank you. All right. We're not that fancy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, for the ships, I have to have two separate 45-minute shows. 
Right. And I had done a residency in Pittsburgh at a venue called Liberty Magic. And they wanted like an hour, hour and 15 to an hour and a half. And I was like terrified when I was like, that's so much time. Um, but I do, I have, I mean, I have so much material, like a lot of tricks. Right. Um, but I'm also very picky with what I put on the stage. Like with right. magic, you can buy a trick and just do it. You can't. I just. Right. That is not what I want to do. I want to make every trick I do completely unique to me so nobody else could see it performed like that. So for me, it takes a lot of time because, I mean, there's only so many things you could do. You make something appear, disappear, change place, you know, like it's not, not a crazy amount of things that can happen. So to make things unique and routine them in an interesting way, it they could take years to develop. There's... This baseball routine you'll see, I've been, it's been changed probably, I don't know, 40 times. <laughs> like I've added so much and done so much differently to get it to the stage that it's at. It just goes through phases and it's all from, you know, working it out, listening to your audience, really. Yeah. 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 And taping it, watching it and learning and growing and you know, like you always do some sort of recording. And tweaking stuff like I got that I got bits like that I've changed over and over throughout the years, and uh, right and, yeah and just sometimes you just add stuff to them you don't you also don't realize how much material you really have like sometimes right. I was never I was never one of those guys that like to do like Dave Chappelle will go up and do like two hours and I'm like man that's too long for a comedy show I'm just not I'm not a fan of that I mean you can do it but right. I wouldn't want to watch a two hour comedy show you know that's just not my thing and when I first started doing ships, I was like, I looked at the amount of material I have. And like, Noree's is a good example. On that line, I got to have a lot of material. I, I should have, they tell you to have three different 45s, but you almost kind of need four or five because of the amount of shows. You know what I mean? Because we do the club shows. So, but. You know, you, I, I was shocked at how much you and Quinn were working. I was like, there's so many shows you're doing. And it's the same audience over and over. So you can't. I mean, maybe not everybody comes to every show, but there were a lot of people that went to all of your shows. So right. you can't really do the same, close to the same material at all. No, I usually do like, I did, um, the last show is usually a little bit from all the other shows. And then what, I'll, what, right. I, what I will do is my newest stuff, I'll do at least three or four times that week. And the reason is it gives me more time to work on it. You know what I mean? So that way right. I can, the newest thing I want to tighten up the bus, I go, well, I'll do this for, for next this week and then it'll be tighter next week. But then the last night, I even tell people before the show starts, I go, okay, this is going to be like a best of. And sometimes I can get through the show. Like I told like a couple stories I hadn't told before. Um, and also, it's a little bit easier on a ship too for us when we have that uh, because on a ship, especially in that scenario, 12 days after that, they see that many shows, they kind of, they know you. You know what I mean? They kind of got, you got to yes. rapport with the people. So when they come to see you, that you're they're already like on your side, kind of. You know, if they're coming yeah, to see they me, already, the, yeah, they're coming to see me the fifth time. They obviously like something. Nobody's seeing me twice and thinks I suck. You know, what I mean? you're like that guy sucks. Yes. I'm not going back, and that's it. I never, I never have to see that person again, and I'm okay. You know, but if they like you, they keep coming back, and you almost can't lose that battle. You know what I mean? Right. No, these people loved you. So yeah. yeah, it was it was fun to watch. It was I went to all your shows. I oh, loved it. So it sweet. was great. Thank you. I wish I felt so bad. <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait to see you next week. It's I'm so bummed I didn't get to see you at all that week. It'll be it'll be a blast. Well, it's not your fault. I I had one show the first night and that was it. I know so. that was my fault. I blew it off. I was like, I'll just catch you later, and they changed the whole schedule the next morning. I was like, what the f uh, whatever. Now, are you going to do, uh, how's it work at the Magic uh, Castle? You said you got the early slot. Are you going to be in the parlor? Where, you know, how's it going to work? I want to make sure that I'm at the right place at the right time and seeing you. Yes. Um, yeah, so I will be in the parlor. This is my first time doing that room. I'm usually in the close-up room, which is such a cool room because it's yeah. like, you know, seats tw like 20 people. It's so intimate, and the Magic is like right there. Yeah. And so I've done that the last three times I've performed there, but um, – I'm very excited to try the parlor. It's a new yeah. experience for me. So, yeah, seven fifteen, eight fifteen, and nine fifteen okay. are my shows. Okay, cool, good. Yeah, I'm excited, man. It's gonna be great. It'll be a lot of fun. When do you get into town? Actually, Friday. Um, I'm doing a show 
in Santa Monica at this other venue called Illusion Magic Lounge. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you mentioned that. When is that, Sunday? So, on Friday night. So, okay. Friday night. And then um, I have friends that were my roommates when I lived in Branson, Missouri. And oh, they right. now live close to the castle. So, I'm just going to hang out with them for a bit. Oh, cool. Hey, let's talk about Branson a little bit. That was something we talked in the last. Yeah. Time. Yeah. How was it I like? I love it. What was it like living in Branson? It seems like you would fit right in it there. Was, <laughs> it was so great. I mean, wow. It was the best experience of my life. <laughs> no. Um, it was, was the best. <laughs> Psych. It was. So the weird thing is, is I. I am one of those people who has always been in my head about I'm not quite good enough. Like that's just, I'm sure a lot of performers are like that. And for me, that is, it, it was hard for me. I just was always second guessing what I was doing. I did also side note, had a terrible mom who also told me I was terrible. So I think that, you know, kind of gets in your head. Um, and then I moved to Vegas thought that's what I need to do. Magicians live in Vegas. I was 19, had no clue what I was doing, how to market myself. I mean, Penn and Teller, Copperfield, like nobody cares about me. I'm a nobody who, what am I doing here? So I started assisting magicians and bartending as like a way to make money. Cause I had no clue where to go, what to do. So I got a call to go do a show in Branson, Missouri. I had no idea where that was. I'd never heard of it. And I just said, okay. And <laughs> I figured this is gonna force me to get out of my comfort zone bartending at the Cheesecake Factory and assisting other magicians. So packed up my car, drove to Branson and yeah, um, it was unique. That's so ballsy. Uh, people, That's just a ballsy move, by people, the way. That's just that's really impressive. Yeah, I just figured I needed to, and I did. So it was a good kickstart for me to be like, you got to sink or swim. Like, you can't sit in this cushy, I'm making good money bartending, doing magic sometimes. Like, I didn't like that. I wanted to do magic. So I figured if I forced myself to get out of the comfort zone and end up in the middle of nowhere in Branson, Missouri, doing yeah. magic. At least I'm doing what I want to do. Right. The only problem was, is people thought I was a witch. So <laughs> that was... <laughs> That's my favorite part of the story. They literally thought you were not a witch. Not super great. No. I guess. Yes, like, not no. just one. <laughs> yeah, everyone. Not just one person. Many people. Many, many people, many people like where... Yeah, I'd go to Walmart and people would throw things at me and say, get the witch out of here. I can't believe so. that mentality exists still to this day anywhere, let alone I know. France and Missouri. I mean, I think because I grew up in California, then lived in Vegas. I had never seen the small town oh, God, Midwest, yeah. not even Midwest. I don't know what that's considered, but just some of these people never leave. They've lived in Branson or Missouri their whole lives. And they yeah, it's never... the center of their universe. It's the center of their whole yeah. universe is right. Yeah. That's all they know. Yeah, and it's, uh, it. I noticed that like when I used to go and work these small towns in the south, I would run into these towns that were incredibly racist, and I would be, I'd right. be shocked. I'd be like, you know, I grew up in Chicago, lived in L.A., been all over the world, and I'd go into a town and working with a black guy, and we would get treated like shit everywhere. And, and you know, he would tell me, he's like, oh, and I never noticed it. I, we, I, I, I noticed the white privilege thing when it was brought up right. to me in this instance because there's some truth to that. There's a lot of truth to the fact that I can walk in anywhere. Like Louis C.K. does a bit about. It's actually really funny. You can walk out of any time machine at any place in the world as a white guy and just walk into a room and they would go, oh, hi, you want to have a table and sit down and eat? You can't do that with any other nationality. You can uh, you, you could disappear or, you, could, you know, you some, some centuries you don't want to walk into. Uh-oh. Look at she froze. You there? Hey, you're back. Okay. I lost you for a second. Uh oh. Lost. Oh, there you go. Okay. I know. I'll be back. I missed um, your Louis C.K. joke. Yeah, well it was he did a bit where you could be as a white guy, you could get out you could go into a time machine and get out at in any decade, any century, and walk into a place and they go, Oh hi, oh you're white. Come on in and have a seat. And it would be no problem. 
And you can't do that with right. other, other nationalities. You're, you know, there's some centuries you don't want to get off the time machine. You're like, no, I think I'm okay in here. I'm just staying in here. But you don't realize that mentality. It's like the witch thing. You don't realize people really act that way in a town. When you go there and like, are you no. people? Is this 1920? What is wrong with you people? You know, grow up. I know. It's I, It was a like a weird, really weird thing for me to see. And I was just so confused by it. I just was like, okay, this is actual life. I thought this was movies, not for yeah, real. This is, this so. is a real place. <laughs> You're like, am I being punked? This is everyone's like that here. Are you, uh, yeah. did you, how long were you living? How long were you in Branson? A little over two years. Oh my God. Um, did, did you yeah. date? Did you date anyone? Did you have a boyfriend or anything down there? Was it I possible was, to date? There, like, I, tr I think a tiny bit, like, because everybody kind of knew everybody. So I right. remember I, kind of saw somebody but i was like yeah i don't know no right. don't don't love this so i was super grateful i found my super best friend who's now in la she she grew up in the same area as me but we didn't meet until we were both randomly in branson missouri she's also a big sports fan and uh she was assisting another magician so I found a great friend and we became roommates and then she had a boyfriend there. The three of us together in Missouri were like, you know, th three's company here. <laughs> oh, right on. Okay. Luckily I had a Luckily you had what? Oh, sorry. Luckily I had a good crew of like friends around me, but that um, really, that the helps, actual man. people I didn't know yeah, we're horrible. Right. That the first time yes. I moved to LA, uh, I didn't like LA that much because I didn't know a lot of people, and I was just starting out doing stand up. But, right. but my second time, I had like a good group of friends, and it makes the whole world a difference to adjust to the world around you if you've got a good core of people that can be there for you. You know what I mean? Friends that can support you. Oh my god, it was it was amazing. It was so helpful because they they all were going through the same things. They understood we're all entertainers. We're all trying to be entertainers in this weird little world and then we all decided yeah. okay we gotta go i moved yeah. to chicago and they moved to la so <laughs> good for them yeah no they get out um well let's tell you on this then since you brought it up the uh we, this is another thing i think we have in common the whole the mom thing i mean my mom wasn't exactly like your mom but uh i didn't get along with my mom it was not a good uh it was not a good scenario. And I think that's a big reason. That's the look mom, look at me mom thing. You know, you're, that's another thing that makes you an entertainer, I think, or pushes you into entertainment is when you get shitty treatment from your parents. And it's almost like <laughs> a subconscious, you know, I think it's woven into you. And, may, and maybe it's just, it's, I really think, that. I think a lot, of, I know a lot of entertainers are like that. I don't know many entertainers that have a great, a great relationship with both their parents. I'll be honest with you, most of them. Right. No, I, I've seen that a lot too. The weird thing is, though, is like I was into magic when I was six before I even realized my mom wasn't a great human, right. you know. Right. But what was so nice is that magic is very it can be very isolating and you can. That's OK, though, because like it you have to practice. It's a constant practice and there's no real way to practice except for being by yourself working yeah. on stuff. So. I, even though my mom kept me and my sister like away from the world, I was still, I had this passion that I was obsessed with and I was able to work on it. Um, she didn't allow me to do very many things because we were so sheltered. She let me do magic because it made her money. So I started making money right. doing magic when I was like 12. Oh God, for right. birthday so you were already pulling in an income when you were a little kid. Yeah, right. schools, festivals, anything like that. So she was all about it because she made sure the checks were made out to her and the right. fact <laughs> she never let me have a bank account um she was very careful and calculating in ways to make sure she got the money she didn't give me the freedom to let me learn how to drive she never wanted me to have that so she made sure either her or my stepdad would take me to gigs so that way i could immediately hand them the check or the right. cash oh um yeah so the only thing is like for me 
whatever. I had a place to live. It's not like she was starving me. I was yeah. a kid. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was doing what I wanted to do. And that's, I think that's why I didn't like hate her more for that. Cause at least she was letting me do what I loved. Yeah. Um, and, and I think I was able to just focus on that and be like, this is what I love. And hey, right now she's taking it all, but at least hopefully I can use this skill when I escape this lovely human. And yeah, <laughs> <this> lovely human. <laughs> well, yeah, some, she was. But, but you made it the, best, the thing that impressed me the most about you when we did this podcast last time that I wanted to get to today was, uh, by the way, we did this podcast before and I screwed it up. So we're doing this a second time because I screwed up. Yeah, my bad. Um, you built a, you <laughs> built a whole career out of that. You built a whole, you know, you came, you came from that situation with a parent that wasn't very well. You found, you dove into magic. It was something you really liked to do. You worked at it. Then she kind of took advantage of you early on, but you built a whole life and a career out of it. You've built, you've made something out of yourself through all of that. That's the most impressive thing to me ever is to see somebody, you can only, you can only deal with what you have. You know what I mean? You can only, right. you can only deal with what you have. So you get whatever you have. And you go, all right, I got this, this, and this, I can do this, this, and this. And you, it seems like you did, you've done a great job building a great career and a great life out of what you've been dealt with. That's really impressive and awesome. I mean, I, I know so many people grow up in hard situations and it's, it, it was awful at the time. Like my, she was an alcoholic and not uh, just n like verbally abusive, you know, just constantly telling me I'm terrible and an awful right. human. And I, I mean, I was, I'm still one of the most boring people alive, but she made me out to be like this monster. The thing is, is that I had a sister who we were able to have each other to like listen to and lean on. And we encouraged each other and would constantly remind one another that we're going to get out of this one day and we just have to get through this. And I think having that sibling that was, we we're so, we're only 16 months apart. So like, very close in age and i think we both we kind of understood things when we were like 12 13 we started to really understand that oh this isn't normal you don't drink two boxes of wine a day oh <laughs> that's not <laughs> <laughs> one person shouldn't drink all this wine this is a wine for a party this is no wine for a party <laughs> And I think just having somebody to talk it out to. And I mean, I also have the, the other members of my family, like my grandma, who was so supportive. And then my aunt, uncle, and my cousins, like I have an amazing family. My aunt, and uncle, they did a lot. They tried for a long time to even like get custody of us because of they saw who my mom was, but oh, she was a great liar. She was able oh to get out of so many things. and. My sister and I just realized we got to stick it out and get out of it when we're 18. So Man, good for that's you guys. what we did. It's def it's it's hopeless as a, another adult to look at another adult that's a screw up and see them raising their kid and know there's nothing that you can do to help those kids. You know what I mean? Right. But the parent still has all the right. The parent still has all the right. rights. And like you said, if your mom's good and at least smart enough to lie and bullshit her way through stuff, they can't just take you away from her unless yeah. she's, you know, unless there's drugs involved or crime or something else. But right. I mean, the gray area is so large that there's a big shitty parent area <laughs> that exists Right. that people can be a shitty parent and nobody knows. And there's nothing you can do right. about it. By the time you're 18, it's too late. You know, and then right. when you're 18, you either leave on your own or you're gone. And some people come out damaged and hurt. And I mean, you, you like I said, you, 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 how's your sister doing? Amazing. We actually live on the same street in Chicago. It's really oh, that's fun. That's really cool. That's good. Oh, that's right. You didn't mention yeah, that. Yeah, okay. she's she's the opposite. Like she's never been in entertainment. She's like the global sales manager for Hyatt Hotels. Oh, so look at she's her. pretty fancy. She's got a like yeah. a, a, a big girl job. Like a real job. Like I have friends. Real like jobs. That. You have a real look at you, real job. Yeah, I have a friend. I like, know. <laughs> he, a friend of mine sells magic sells medical equipment. He goes into hospitals and pitches this elaborate uh, beep or whatever they're called. This thing that beeps, you know, the things that beep right. in the hospital, he sells those. He know what they do. He knows what they do, but I joke with them all the yeah. time because he travels all over the place. They go, that's a real job. That's like, right. real. he's got to study specs. I can't study specs. I'm not doing any of that. 
Well, that's so cool that your sister lives so close to you, man. Well, good for you guys, man. I was really, that's why I'm glad we could redo this. I was really impressed with that story about you and your sister, and that's uh, that's cool. That's really, really cool. And neither, you guys haven't talked to your mom in forever, right? No. Right. No. We, I mean, when this all happened, I was, like, I was 18. I'm now uh, older. older? I'm <laughs> <laughs> Smooth. Well, nice cover. I'm now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm 37. Okay, I'm uh, 37. So it's been a long time. Um, there's been some definitely terrible run-ins. Like she's tried some things that were not great. Um, but no, when this originally happened, my sister and I, everyone in our family, reached out to her and said, "Hey, if you go get some help, if you want to start with an apology, cool." But she she can't it's right i she's just unwilling to get help in any way and she's clearly still unwilling to get help because it's been a long time yeah my my mom was which my mom passed two years ago and uh i remember when we were at her memorial service and it was just me and my brothers and her like in this big cardboard box or whatever and i felt so bad for her but she had no friends and she didn't care she didn't <laughs> She just didn't care. She's like, she would get so mad. She's like, I'm not talking to that person anymore. There was a lot of people. Right. Where she just, in fact, when she passed, she wasn't talking to my youngest brother, Scott. And that's, she was always one brother she wasn't talking to. And it was Scott when she passed away. And it's been hard on Scott, you know. But like, I, she went, I mean, 20 something years without talking to me. Not a word. Didn't talk to me the first 12 years of Anna's life. And then we kind of, wow. we got closer at the end, but she was still, man, she was the angriest woman I ever saw. She would get so mad. She lived in this over 50 community in Florida. Where they had dinners and functions and stuff, and she wouldn't go to any of them. And she just, but you're right. She was the same way. She wouldn't look at herself. She wouldn't think. She was never wrong. She would just right. go, no, no, no. And you're like, oh, okay, all right, I guess. It just seems like a lonely existence, but all right. I know. Yeah, I don't think my mom has a friend in the world. She never did. Like, yeah. people would learn pretty quickly. They would, and like my teachers, they they started to ask questions and they started to figure it out and they were everyone was always they got a little suspicious of her but <laughs> yeah well you start to learn from behavior man like if you see like when kids are little they're kids and they do one thing they do another thing and you you come into a thought process or that situation you're thinking they're just a kid but you meet the parent Correct. once twice and a third time and if the pattern continues and you, you notice it you, when you when my kids went to school i noticed the other parents that were shitheads you notice almost immediately, right. like, oh, this guy's an idiot. I can't, I can't. You know, there's just a handful of people. And if, after all, teachers will figure out, oh, it's Mrs. Johnson, and we got to, she's here. Let's let's just get through this meeting, and we'll try not to, you know. <laughs> but it's even harder for those teachers, too, to look at it, because I'm sure they're looking at you in that situation. They want to reach out and do stuff and say anything to help the child. or the, and But right. their hands are tied. Their hand, everybody's hands are right. tied in the situation. Yeah. No, that's that's what's so crazy. Is there's nobody could do anything. They we right. we could talk about it, but nothing yeah. nothing could be done. So it was just, and that's what my sister and I realized. We're like, nothing could be changed because the man she's still married to and was at the time, she like took his life away. He didn't have any friends or family either, and he right. wasn't sticking up for himself, so he wouldn't stick up for us. And right, she. She was terrible to him. I don't understand how they're still married, but I think it's just because he doesn't have any other options in his mind. It's just too late, you know? Well, it's a codependent thing, too. You fall into a cycle of being miserable, and then the miserable right. is the, what's the phrase? Is the devil you know? You know what I mean? Once you live in that right. life, you're so used to it, you don't want to make a change. And the older you get, I guess maybe you just don't want to. It just seems so uh, empty. You know what I mean? It just seems, right. it just seems so rough and empty. But you guys, but anyway, I'm, I'm good for you, man. You got, you came out of it. I mean, you, not only did you get out of it, and your sister and you were close, you built a kick-ass career out of it, and your sister lives a block away. That's that's the best part of that story, I think. That she lives, right. she lives right by you. Good for you guys, man. Is yeah. she into sports like Words. you are? No. How did no. you get into sports? How did you get into sports? How did that happen? I think that was one thing that we only had, like, three TV channels as well, so right. that's right. what was on. Right, the, of course. It's always sport, on. Yeah. Sports were on. And that's what I saw. And I got like obsessed with reading the stats. Like I get so excited to get the paper on Monday after <laughs> Sunday football games to read about 
oh, who had this many catches? Oh, yeah. how many yards did Rich Gannon throw for? You know, like it was, it was weird. But I, um, I don't know. It was, I got into football at such a young age and I fell in love with Dan Marino and, uh, and that was he's it. the man. <laughs> that was it. That was over. <laughs> Yeah. I always like that and with the baseball scores. I like getting the I like getting the paper in the morning and sitting on. I should sit down and read the box scores before the. There was a lot of stuff on the internet, but one thing we used right. to get in Chicago, we used to get uh, the West Coast box scores. We'd have to get them the next morning because you couldn't get right. them that night. So I love getting up at like uh, getting the late edition of the morning paper, and then watch that. And that way you could get all the West Coast box scores. You just sit there and read about who went two for three and th- three for four. And I used to read all that stuff. I used to love that. I know. I still do. I don't, I, (laughs) I mean, I play fantasy baseball and football and all that. So I guess I need to know. (laughs) Yeah, you need to, which by the way, I just cut your guy Blackburn off my team about a week or two ago. I was thinking, well, he's on the IL. Be nice. I'm, I am being nice. We got to win a league here. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I had a bunch of guys that were injured and they came back off the inter league. I got a pretty deep pitching staff. So I ended up, uh, I dropped him and moved on. So. Fine. Anyway, but Bruce. every time he didn't do well, I thought of you. I sent you a couple messages a couple times. I know. You were mad at me, but it's not <laughs> my fault. I wasn't mad at you. I was just like, I was like, thanks a lot. Here, this is your guy. <laughs> yeah, we're also the Oakland A's who aren't even Oakland anymore no, because yeah. of whatever is going to happen. Yeah, who knows where you're going <laughs> and where you're going to be whatever. playing in the next two years. Who knows? Sacramento for now. Uh, is, okay. Is are you going there for sure? Is that a done deal or are they okay. Sacramento for us till they build the thing in Vegas, but none right. of the Vegas stuff has even actually been finalized. Right. Like right, right. People keep saying, Well, they blew up the Tropicana. I'm like, Yeah, but they were doing that before baseball was ever an option. Yeah, that was plus that's a, t- that's a terrible spot for a baseball stadium, by the way. And yeah. you know, you live there. We I was just there. Yeah. And I did Brad's places right across the street in the MGM Grand. That intersection, it handles two casinos, the MGM Grand and Brad's Club and the convention centers all right there. And he's like, you're going to put a baseball stadium right there? <laughs> like right on that corner? Yeah, right. For 80 games Because like the a airport year? traffic yeah. is also yeah. coming from there. It's just 10 no. even, Right, it's all right in that area. So they should. No. There's so much room there. They should push it out off the strip. I mean, there's a lot of places all over Vegas you can put that, put that stadium. Well, there. Also, baseball is a summer sport. Vegas in the summer Boy, is 120 wild. degrees. Well, it's going to so. have to be a dome. They're going to have to do a dome. They can't do an outdoor game there, right? They no. Because they have a minor league team there. Right. But, but they play. They don't play at, during the day, do they? They do. Yeah, yeah. I've been, I would go to those games. They were hot. Yeah, 115 degrees. Those guys would have to die. That's hot. <laughs> that's really hot. I don't want to walk across the street, let alone play baseball in 115 degree weather. <laughs> I love it. See, that was the thing for me in Vegas. 110, 20, that's heaven. I love hot. Oh, I'm really? always freezing. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. You were. Well, you're a tiny little thing. <laughs> I can see. I'm, that's why it cracks me up. You're in Chicago, which yeah, uh, the winters does not. Uh, your body's not cohesive with the. Uh, Chicago weather. No, you look not at like all. A Vegas girl, right? Exactly. <laughs> all right, man. Let's wrap this up. I'm so glad you. Thank you for doing this again because I feel bad like I screwed it up uh, the first time. Um, oh, I'm so mad. I hate talking to you. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> oh, I forgot to hit record. Oh. <laughs> ah. No. Okay. Do me a favor. Look to the camera and plug uh, anything you want to plug, and we'll plug this. We'll get it up for next week while you're in LA, so we can plug it and see how that works. Okay, um, yes, come to Magic Castle. Well, if you can, you have to get in secretly. So if you know people, go to the Magic Castle. Um, This, what is this? Friday, if you're in Santa Monica, the Illusion Magic Lounge. Check that out. Illusion Magic Lounge, they have tickets on their site. And yeah, you can follow me at Pages Magic, and I keep you posted on what's going on. Perfect, there we go. Paige, thank you so much. I'll see you in less than a week. Yay. Thanks right. for having me. Thanks for being here. Bye. Bye. You're still watching? That's amazing. Nobody does that. Nobody, but you did. That means you want more. Pick one of these clips. Go for it. I dare you. Hey, also, follow one of those social media thingies. <laughs>